measure and if you remember we have split a little bit uh, things by taking out beta n 2 minus s over d uh, the energy of the equilibrium measure and then e to the minus beta n minus s over d the next order energy. So I'm back to the I'm back to the uh, usual scale. I'm not rescaling things anymore. And I'm going to cheat enormously by confusing the equilibrium measure and the thermal equilibrium measure, uh, just because it's more convenient for my presentation. But so I'm using some properties that are true for the thermal measure, and I'm plugging in the non-thermal one. But OK, I hope you forgive for that. And today, I want to talk about fluctuations, because I know that some people in the room have been asking me a lot about fluctuations. So it's time to talk about it. So what we want to look at is uh, linear statistics, so phi uh, regular. And we want to look at sum of phi of xi. And probably we will have to subtract off uh, the expected uh, behavior. OK? And we want to s understand what is the size of this random variable with this measure. <coughs> so to do that, we have only one, there's only one proof so far. And um, the proof goes by looking at the Laplace transform of such fluctuations or of linear statistics. Uh, Laplace transform of linear statistics. So let's look at log expectation of E T sum of phi of xi. And I'm going to want to understand this for every uh, real, value, uh, real parameter t. Uh, but to make it uh, more um, suited to this thing, let's add minus beta and minus s over d times t. So later, we, what we will want to do is we want to take uh, t equals tau tau n s over d over beta. Uh, sorry, I'm going to do one minus s. s right. I'm going to do one minus s over d. Ay, ay, ay. OK, so the real uh, Laplace transform would be to do e tau sum of phi of xi. OK, so that would be my parameter. But this tau, I decide to write it in this weird form and to study it for t. OK, and later I will rechange the variables and study it in terms of tau. OK, so we want to show, we want to show uh, we want to show that this, this thing converges to a Gaussian, and it's equivalent in the sense of a Laplace transform to show that the Laplace transform converges to the Laplace transform of a Gaussian. And so it suffices to show that the log of the Laplace transform trans converges to something quadratic, so some mean plus some variance uh, times t squared, right? So this will be the mean, this will be the variance, maybe there's a one half somewhere. Okay, so if I can if I can show that, um, I will have proved actually a central limit theorem in the sense of convergence of of this uh, this variable. 
some of our evexi. Two of those, yes? M and, and B are a function of phi? Yes, yeah, so to be determined. So the mean and the variance, they will depend on phi, yes. So we will extract them from the computation, so let's not uh, worry about them yet. I'm just telling you the concept. Right? So the reason why I uh, insert the linear statistics in this way is obvious, is because if you compute this, okay. It's the same as integrating against uh, this density. So e to the minus beta and um, okay. I'm gonna do one minus s over d sum of phi of xi, and I'm going to go back to the original h n of x n. So you remember what the energy is, right? So let's put it back here. Okay, so this is all in the exponent. And let's divide by So this is Hn, this whole thing. Okay, so the only point of this, uh, this here is to show you that this thing, and there is a T, can be combined with V, right, as a sort of new external potential. So after this long computation, you just write this as Zn the partition function for a new potential, which is V plus T phi divided by Z and beta for V. Okay, so you just regroup this guy with this guy, and there is a T in front. And so this is why I took care to put the same factor in front beta n 1 minus s over d, beta n 1 minus s over d. Because from then on, you see, if you express things in terms of this variable t, the notation is just much simpler, but it's not a loss of generality, okay? So this uh, method I, is, appears in the, for the first time in a paper of Johansson in the, the case of 1D log, uh, log gas. And it's quite, um, well, it's quite a natural uh, first step. But now you're there, and what you have to compute is the ratio of partition functions. It boils down to evaluating the ratio of partition functions for different uh, external potentials. Okay, so maybe uh, physically what this means is you, you view it as you're applying a force to your system Right, this external force phi, and you're trying to understand how the system responds to that force. And indirectly, it uh, gives you information on the fluctuations. Probably something like that. Okay, so now how does a, a partition function depend on the V? Okay, so first we have an expansion that we saw um, two or three times ago. The dependence in V is through the equilibrium measure somehow, right? So there is a mu V and there is a mu V plus T phi. Each of them has their own equilibrium measure. And what we saw is that what comes out here is E to the minus beta N2 minus S over D. E of mu V plus T phi. This we know comes out. So a priori, when s is different from zero, you really have a different scaling uh, between uh, the phi and the v, no? I mean, the, the power uh, is not... I try to put the same. Huh? 
I'm sorry, no, it's a sign. No, <laughs> that's why I that's why I carry uh, sorry. you see there's like some normalization is going to come out naturally that comes from the value of S and D. Okay, so there's this. And then there's what I called K and beta of mu V plus T phi, if you remember. And then here there is the same. So we had already split by uh, extracting the leading order of the partition functions. OK, so these terms, they're actually completely computable. They're already computed. And I can tell you uh, the form that they take. They're going to give you exactly the variance you want and a little piece of the mean. But OK, I thought I had the notes somewhere. Maybe it's on a different page. OK, so anyway, there is going to be um, e to the minus beta and 2 minus s over d times something quadratic in phi. OK, Let, let's not even compute it, but it's, it's computable, right? You agree with me? OK, so this ratio, we can make it explicit in t and phi. And V, of course. So it's going to uh, bring out exactly the, the piece of the variance, so the T squared term, right? You, the variance is, is a factor of tau squared or T squared. Uh, and then <coughs> what you have to understand is these next order guys. So this is good. And basically, uh, we need to understand that. OK, so now we come back to the discussion we had yesterday, which is we worked on trying to understand free energy expansions, which is the behavior of these things when n goes to infinity. OK, so yesterday, what we did is we proved something like that. That if you look at the log of k and beta, or let's say, for the indicator function for the, for the density 1 in a cube of size r, and you divide by the volume of the cube, it goes as r goes to infinity to a certain number which depends only on beta. This was the thermodynamic limit, the existence of a thermodynamic limit. And this is a K with Neumann boundary condition, zero Neumann boundary condition. <coughs> All right, so this piece of information is not quite enough because now what we need is uh, for varying densities, mu v. So how do you go from a, from a constant density to a varying density? Well, there is a, a first idea that we're going to implement right away, which is a transport method. Okay, so use a transport method. And now I'm going to present it only in the Coulomb case because uh, the non-Coulomb case would be more involved. And uh, so far, it hasn't been done even. So. so for now, I go to the Coulomb case. What's nice about the Coulomb case is that the equilibrium measure is relatively explicit, uh, at least in its support. So I don't know if you remember. There is some set sigma where it's supported. 
And you can compute because you have h mu v plus v is constant in the support of mu v. You can take the Laplacian of the relation and you find that minus uh, cd mu v plus Laplacian v is zero in the support of mu v. And so in particular, the density of mu v in its support, so if v is sufficiently regular, the density is the Laplacian. So it's really the Laplacian divided by cd. The part that's unknown, it's really this set. Right? You don't really, the set is, is given to you implicitly as solution of a free boundary problem. But the density is explicit if v is regular enough. And so now what I'm going to do for simplicity, uh, it's an important simplification. And when you want to deal with other cases, it's much harder. We're going to assume that our phi is supported in the support of the equilibrium measure. So we are essentially, we are probing the thing inside. We don't want uh, support that overlaps the boundary, uh, at least in the first pass, OK? So then if yeah. phi is it because we expect a different behavior? It's going to be a different behavior if you have a support that overlaps the boundary. There's going to be the formulas are going to be different. You have more fluctuations? No, the fluctuations will be of the same order. It's just that the formula will be uh, will involve some harmonic extensions of your test function. So you you have to work much harder to make it uh, work. And in particular, we don't have the local laws. So uh, yesterday, something I didn't tell you, I, 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 pro I proved local laws. You know, you remember? These local laws are actually in the bulk. Because every time you screen, you have to go a little bit inside. So you don't have the local laws up to the boundary. So you wouldn't be able to localize at micro scale and at the boundary. So if you want to be able to go down to micro scale, you have to be inside. But if you don't want to go to micro scale, you can handle a file that's here. We did it with Thomas Leblay. It's done in the paper. It's just more tedious. So for today, I prefer to avoid. OK, so because phi, if the support of phi is included in sigma, you can check that mu v plus t phi is actually has the same support, doesn't change. And you just change the density uh, into Laplacian v plus t Laplacian phi. So. That's very explicit. It's very nice. As soon as you leave the Coulomb case, you would lose all of these explicit formulas. OK, so the idea is that we're going to transport, so find an approximate transport of the form identity plus TV such that Identity plus TV push forward mu V is approximately mu V plus T phi. So here, every time I, I say approximately, I mean to linear order in T. So you, have, you want to think of T as small. OK, so think T small. I erase the thing, but. OK, so think t small, because eventually, I told you that eventually t will, is going to be tau. And I, of course, I forgot, but there's, there is an s, s over t minus 1, right? Divided by beta, if anyone took notes. You see, this thing is small in n, when n goes to infinity. So you can really think of t as small. And so we're going to do linearizations, right? Every time mu v plus t phi. This is a small perturbation of mu v. Uh, and so I can, I can find it as a transport of mu v with a small uh, perturbation of identity. And you can find the, uh, proxy, the correct v. So how do you solve that? You solve linearized mont -Jean equation. If you wanted to transport exactly, you would solve mont jean -Pierre. But since you're only caring about the, the linear terms, you can solve linearized mont jean -Pierre. And so that's simply uh, solving divergence of v mu equals the variation of mu, which is just 
Laplacian phi, right? Which is d dt t zero of mu v plus t phi. Okay, so my perturbation is Laplacian phi. I just need to solve this relation, and I approximately transport. Uh, so you can check that identity plus TV for mu V is indeed mu V plus T phi up to a little o of T terms. Okay, so it's nice here is that this transport V, this vector field V, you can have it quite explicitly. So here, and because I'm inside, I can just take You can have it explicitly. I'm not going to use it very much, but you could take v equals grad phi divided by mu v. It would it would perfectly solve this equation. Okay. So why do a transport? Because when I look at k mu v plus t phi divided by k mu v. We can write that. So what is this? Is e to the minus beta n minus s over d f x n mu v plus t phi d mu v d mu v. So I told you I put mu v here. I'm exaggerating a little bit the situation. But This mu v plus t phi. Okay, so you can use this map identity plus t v as a change of variables. So you can write this as identity plus t v push forward mu v this way. So this is mu v. This way you will have the same reference measure on top and bottom. So the of course th this does this does a change of variables. And so it changes xn. So I hope you understand by what I mean by identity plus TV of xn. I push every particle in this direction. And here you have identity plus TV push forward mu V d mu v n times divided by the same thing without the push forward. OK, so. Uh, the idea is we have two different equilibrium measures. We're going to push forward one onto the other. And we actually push the whole gas with the same transport. Right? So you push the particles and the background by this map identity plus TV. And so what you get here is just the expectation. Yeah. Can you explain why in the numerator, uh, so inside the F, so you start it with the mu v plus, plus t phi, right? And now you apply the push forward to mu v. No, inside the f. But yeah. this is just a rewriting of this. This has not changed. I don't change it. This, this is the same. This is equal to this. Up to a uh, little o of t terms, okay, I, I neglect. Uh, yeah, we, we, we put them under the rug for today. OK, so I say that mu, of course, I'm making some errors here that are quadratic in t. But. So I'm going to, I'm using this. So when you do the actual proofs, you have to work at controlling the quadratic terms. 
Anything else is not clear. Jacobian is one, right? Ah, uh, because you see, there's no Jacobian because I've put it in a, in terms of the reference measure. So you push the measure, you don't have a Jacobian. It's the advantage. Uh, if you had the Lebesgue measure, you would have a, a Jacobian. So. Well, this is the definition of push forward. That's all I'm using. Read Cedric's book for us. Yes. <laughs> Except it was a mistake of mine to do the uh, sharp sign uh, at, the, at the same level like this. Ah, uh, yes, I, I, I've adopted it. You like it down? You think we should yeah, move down, it down? Yeah, I, I prefer it down now. Ah, OK. All right. All right. Too late, huh? <laughs> You've already converted uh, half of the planet. So. Make mistakes when you were a young man. Okay. So um, with this uh, change of variables, we find that we are just computing the expectation of e to the minus beta, blah, 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 and just the difference of f identity plus tv of xn, identity plus tv. minus f of xn mu v, close all parentheses. Okay. And so this thing, in fact, we have already seen it. This at leading order, it's t, something I'm going to call a1 xn mu v v, where a1 is the first derivative of fn along the transport v, along the vector field v. So if you remember on uh, fr Friday, I told you it's going to be very useful to look at how f varies when you push in a direction v. We used it for the dynamics, and here it is again. So it's going to be t. In fact, there is a second order term, which you could compute as well. OK, plus other terms even more negligible. And what is a1? It's defined as a these double integrals away from the diagonal in fact a2 you could compute as well it would be v of x minus v of y you'd have two derivatives here Whatever that means. Okay, so it's my first derivative along the transport of the energy. And now, what we learned uh, on Friday is that we have a functional inequality that controls this A1. Okay, so functional inequality, the commutator estimate is that A1 is pointwise in terms of configurations controlled by the energy plus terms that are not bad. So, you know, these other terms. equals zero plus this is the uh, functional inequality and what I didn't tell you is that we also have a second order functional inequality that says exactly the same for a2 so this is c and it has the Lipschitz norm also
And this one has the same thing, except you're going to have second order norms of V. And things like other terms, but same stuff. So we have actually functional inequalities at arbitrary order. So if we plug that into this relation, so now let's go back somewhere here. We can thus estimate Kn of mu v plus t phi divided by Kn of mu v as the expectation of something. OK, so you, 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 maybe you will agree with me that at leading order in t, when t goes to 0, I can take it down from the exponential. So. If I take the log here, it's approximately equivalent to the expectation of beta n minus s over d t a1, which I can bound by t expectation beta Fn, I guess of plus lower order terms, huh? Fn, Xn, V plus my orders, blah, blah. But now we know the size of these guys because yesterday we proved the uh, a priori bounds. We know that Fn is typically, this is typically of order n1 plus s over d. In fact, in exponential moments, it's of that order. So here I went to expectation, it's even much weaker. So this is less than c beta t n. And so this, I claim, is much better than what we started from because these things individually, they're of order n. We saw that yesterday. But when you look at the ratio, if t is small, you gain. Okay, so this is much better than c beta n suddenly because you have the t in factor. And what t do we want to take? It depends for fluctuations. I told you we want to take t of order n s over d minus 1, right? There's beta. So for instance, if you're in uh, the log case in dimension 2, t is 1 over n. And so now you get that this ratio is bounded. So you get from you go from information that something's bound by n. I wrote the opposite. To a star which was equal to No t should be small. In fact, it's just tau times n plus small power. Okay, so this thing already has two consequences. So first corollary, 
I'm going to get a bound of the order of fluctuations. So, sorry, but for, for this bound, uh, did you need uh, at some point the screening of yesterday or not at all? No. no. So, in, in, a, in a sense, uh, uh, I mean, it seems to, to, to be really good, this, this transport to yes. you. Uh, it's a bit orthogonal to a screening where you, you decided to, to erase everything and rebuild. Exactly. So, yeah. in fact, we, are, we have two approaches to, to uh, understanding the free energy. One is by transport, but this only gives you the relative free energy. You have, it's only for ratios. And the other one is by screening and additivity. And later, what we're going to do is we're going to combine the two. We're going to play on the fact that we have two ways of looking at it, and that's going to give us some extra information. But this thing is not more than what I showed you on the board. There is no big technical. Uh, Except you have to control these uh, quadratic terms that I throw away. But other than that, yeah. OK, so what we have shown, uh, the corollary, is that the log of the expectation of these fluctuations, and here you have to put, what did I say, beta n, 1 minus s over d, sum of phi of xi, is bounded by c beta n. So now pick your favorite t. Uh, so apply to any t that's small enough. Even 1 is OK. And you get an, a piece of information. So in particular, for instance, if s is 0, you take t equals 1 over n. And you find that log of expectation of e to the minus beta sum of phi of xi is bounded. OK, so, so th there, is th there, is, there is this extra terms I took, uh, I took aside. Huh? So this is. Uh, so there's the log of the e to the minus. Here are the explicit terms. OK. Should be a bit more careful here. Because I have these explicit terms, you know, that I threw away. Is there any smaller? Huh? Is it smaller? No, it's of order one, the explicit term. So plus explicit term. And there is a t squared integral of grad phi squared in it. So there is a t squared n squared. Plus another term in t that I forgot. OK, so if you take s equals 0, t is 1 over n, this thing will be exactly 1. So now you, have, you see that you have to tune. You have to tune your order in, uh, in such a way that you see a finite variance. So pick the right t that makes the variance uh, order 1. It depends on s and d. But I'm in the Coulomb case, huh? so s is always d minus 2. But you see that it's going to be different according to the dimension. So s is 0 is dimension 2 for the Coulomb case. You have, uh, so th you have this minus the average. You have to subtract, which is in the explicit terms. <laughs> OK, so it says that fluctuations are bounded O of 1. If you're in dimension 3, for instance, uh, S is 1. You're gonna have some. Uh, you're gonna have to take a different uh, a different t. So it's. I think you have to take n to the minus two thirds. Uh, no. 
Okay, I forget exactly what you have to take, but it's going to tell you that uh, it's going to give you a bound of fluctuations that's going to be uh, n to the one third or n to the one six. Uh, what's particular is in dimension two, this is optimal. In dimension three, uh, this is, it's less good than uh, O of one, and you don't expect that the right order is O of one. However, the bound that, you, that is obtained this way is not sharp in 3D, probably. So it's a bound. It's already better than nothing, but it's not sharp. OK, so this is true in any dimension, but Coulomb. So it's a first bound that you get relatively cheaply. It's not so much work, and you do it by this change of variables method. OK? Can you just explain why it's, it's optimal in dimension 2 and not in higher dimension? OK, in dimension 2, we're going to find after the fact that there is a full CLT at this order. So this is in optimal. And in dimension 3, uh, there is a conditional CLT. So there's not a full proof of CLT, but the conditional CLT happens at a smaller order than what this bound gives. So this bound is a little bit too crude in dimension 3. At least that's the observation after the fact. So, so the point is that um, what I'm going to try to explain next is that this term here, you bound it by the functional inequalities. This is a relatively uh, crude thing because this is configuration wise. Right? This is a point wise thing. But in fact, there is a probabilistic cancellation for, m for most of the con configurations relatively to the Gibbs measure. For most of them, this is actually smaller than that. And in dimension two, this thing is actually typically of order one when this thing is typically of order n. And so you don't see that cancellation there. And it's very hard to catch it, <laughs> I would say. So you said that uh, you obtain this bound using these functional inequalities, which are not optimal, but even though the... the no, no, no. The, the functional inequality is optimal as a functional inequality, because I can, saturate, I can find configurations that saturate it. It's optimal. Yeah, but, it's not optimal. but it's not optimal probabilistically. Right? Probabilistically... Not to get the optimal... Uh, to get the optimal order, yes, but not to get the full CLT. We're not yet at the CLT. If you want the convergence to the Gaussian, you need something more. OK, so this is the sort of easy part up to here. But what this thing does for you is it allows you to complete the picture for the free energy expansion. So now we're going to finish the free energy expansion. Expansion for varying measures. Because yesterday we have a convergence with a rate for the case of the uniform background. Now, what is a, 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 a general varying measure? We need varying measures now because we want to be able to have mu v plus t phi. So it really has to be varying. So, so what we do is we want to split into small cubes in such a way that mu v in each small cube is almost constant up to a small error. Now, when the constant is not 1, I can go back to the case m equals 1 just by a scaling. Because density m or density 1, you go from one to the other by scaling. So what is the scaling formula? I have it somewhere. You can recover it. No. Okay, so by scaling, if mu is equal to m, 
the log of k in a cube divided by the volume of the cube goes to, so it's going to depend on the dimension, you see. So here I'm, I'm taking Coulomb, so you, get, you have 2 minus 2 over d, but if you don't take Coulomb, you would have a s over d. So this is the function f that we have up there. So you see the, the effective temperature, I mean the temperature gets multiplied by this density. And in the logarithmic case, you have 1 minus beta over 4. m log n. So I think it's like that. Actually, yeah, I don't remember if it's like this or like that. But anyway, there's something explicit. So in that dimension 2 is very particular because in dimension 2, this factor is not here. This factor is, what is m. And you're, you have the logarithmic terms. OK, so now we know what it is for mu equals m. How do we do it for mu not so far from m, but not equal m? Well, we do it by transport. Because transport allows us to evaluate the error you make on log k when you vary just a little bit. OK, so evaluate. In each cube, log k of the cube, mu v minus log k in the cube, the average of mu v, let's call it mi. Oh, sorry. Should call this qi. qi. By transport. So if my cubes are small enough, uh, mu is quite close to its mean, and so my transport error is going to give me a small t, if you want. I'm going to have a small t, so I'm going to have a small error. And then I'm going to glue these things by additivity. I have the almost additivity that I discussed yesterday. I won't re-explain it today, but plus almost additivity. It's going to tell me that log k uh, respect to mu is roughly the sum of log k qi mu, so the restrictions to my cubes, plus surface terms, surface errors. So they depend on the size of cubes that I take here in my partition. And this one I approximate it by transport. So I have the surface errors plus the transport errors. OK, so for the surface errors, I want my subdivision to be quite big. I want to have few boundaries. So I want large cubes. But of course, for my transport errors, I want small cubes, because then I approximate well by the mean. So you optimize, you balance the two terms, you see which one gives you, you see which size gives you the best error. And you finish with an error which is worse than the surface error, of course, that you have here, because you have to balance out with the, uh, with the, um, with the uh, transport error, okay? OK, so optimizing in the size of the partitioning. partitioning. Gives me an expansion. Log k for general mu now. And instead of having this uh, m of blah, 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 so it's going to be an integral now. So it's going to be n integral of mu 2 minus 2 over d f beta 
mu to minus 2 over d uh, plus 1 minus beta over 4. So I think I have some, some terms are weird. But so instead of m log m, I have mu log mu, so I have an entropy term here. So all this is of order n. And my error term, so if it was a surface term, it would be 1 minus 1 over d. But unfortunately, I've worsened my error with this method because of the transport. So I, I lose like something like 1 over 2d to give you an idea. Could you have done uh, what you did yesterday directly, <coughs> directly in this filtrating field? Or it would have been a pain for, for the different scales? Uh, it, it is not... Uh, I don't know how to do that. Because the problem is uh, when you do the additivity, when you show that you converge to f of beta with a rate, you need the self-similarity of the problem. Right? You need that when you glue together two, four boxes in 2D, you get an, a box that has the same, it's the same thing that you're trying to compute. But if mu varies when you glue together the boxes, it's not self-similar, so you can't say that you have a limit with a rate. Otherwise, we would be in much better shape. So I, I don't, when I said yesterday I'm going to assume mu is constant, it's really, a, it's not just for presentation, it's really you can only do constants first. If you want to go to non-constants, you do that. So this is, this is a theorem, actually. And you see, I, I had told you yesterday, we're going to get the constant in front of n. So it's here. So I think I, I'm missing some betas. Don't take this formula for face value. It might have some mistakes. But there is an explicit formula. And you see, you have the constant that's in front of n. And you have a rate, which is... Um, explicit and you know you have a little bit of room like it's not only little over n you have negative power okay so this answers a question on its own which is this free energy expansion remember this is the already a next order of free energy the zn had extra terms that were already removed Okay, so now we go back to our question of fluctuations. Remember, understanding the fluctuations requires understanding very precisely the ratio of partition functions. Okay, so now we want, we want to go back to this question. Okay, so here. We have the order n term is identified in terms of this function f. Okay, so now we want to understand again log kn mu v plus t phi. So we have two ways now. One is by transport. We did it before, and it tells us that this is essentially T expectation of A1, right? And then I have these factors. That, okay. There is just one. something like that. By transport or by this formula. Okay. So this formula, it's explicit in 
mu, well, except for this function f. But, uh, uh, yeah. this, this formula was also obtained by transport on each small cell. So the question issue is to do it globally by transport or locally by yes. transport. Yes, exactly. So one is globally by transport, and the other one is locally by transport plus additivity. And you have this sort of limitation of the size of your grid that cannot be too large because it can vary in, in some respect. Yeah. Okay, so now from now on, I'm going to be in 2D. Because in 2D, things are much nicer. I told you in 2D, this is one. Now this is one. Okay, so from star in 2D, you get that log k n. So I, we're even more restricted, it's 2D Coulomb. So this thing tells you what? It tells you beta n. So this, this is the integral of mu, so it's always 1. So this doesn't change, so this is actually a constant. Even though you don't know f of beta, this is constant. So when you make the ratio, you subtract two constants that you don't know, but they get subtracted. And here you get 1 minus beta over 4. Uh, and then you get the, the derivative of mu log mu with respect to phi. So it's, it's actually uh, integral of log d dt of this quantity, uh, d mu v. Okay, so what is the d dt of that? That we, we saw it's Laplacian of phi. Is that correct? Should have the opposite. I think it's this. <laughs> okay, so I have something explicit. And here there is a rate. You know, one minus something. So T, so what is that? It's Laplacian phi log mu v, up to signs maybe, huh? plus O of n, mi 1 minus alpha, and maybe I have some quadratic terms in T. Huh? Okay, quadratic terms in T. So if I compare the two ways of expanding, it actually gives me the value of that. You see this linear term? You have it on one side, you compute it on the other side. So this is explicit. The unknown f of beta has disappeared because, because I, I, I subtract log k's of a constant. So comparing the two, and, and to be honest, if you want to do that, that's really where you need to control the quadratic terms here. So that's why you need the second order functional inequality. It's not enough to have a first order. But comparing the two, morally, what you get is you, you get an equality for this expectation. It has to be equal to n, uh, you know, beta n. Okay. 
Okay. And in fact, it's even better than that. It's it's an exponential moment. So I, I went to expectation, but basically this thing concentrates ar around a constant. So when you look at that, minus appropriate constant. Little o of n. So this is this plus little o of n. So what size is this little o of n? It's actually this error, this one. So it's the rate error. Uh, so this is the the rate error that, that that corresponds to this error of additivity plus transport. The error you make here is there. Okay, so now we can plug it back. Go back to the ways by the way by transport. And what's really nice here is that now we get to multiply by t with t very small. So in dimension two, what you want is you want to take t equal one over n. You want t equal tau over n. Right? And so you get that log k mu v plus t phi with this choice of t is equal to, I told you, t expectation of beta a1. So in dimension 2, there is no s over d. And this thing, I told you, is equal to, OK, so there is some errors that are smaller. Right? It's t squared. t squared. It's actually n t squared. And the, the expectation, now I can replace it. So I get t, beta n, 1 minus beta over 4, integral of Laplacian phi log mu, plus O of n, 1 minus whatever my rate was, times t. So with t equals 1 over n, was 1 over n. I get tau and here I get little o of 1. So you find at the end that this ratio of partition functions converges to a constant. And you get an error little o of 1. This is, this is, this is, this was almost hopeless in the beginning because you, you evaluate everything up to order little o of n a bit better. But here you get little o of 1 because you apply to t equals 1 over n. And what is this? This is a shift to the mean. So I told you the, the leading, there is these explicit terms that contain the variance. It contains the, the mean, and there's actually a shift. So the conclusion, this theorem that we proved with Thomas Leblay, and there was a, a competing proof by uh, Bauer, Schmidt, Bourgad, Nicola, and Yao is that if you look at that, sum of phi of xi minus n integral of phi d mu in 2D, huh? converges to a Gaussian. 
of mean. So the mean is not 0, it's this thing. There is this shift. OK, so, so I wouldn't trust exactly the formula. I think this. it's something like that. And variance, the variance came out of the explicit terms. I didn't compute them for you, but you can trust that it's, it's this. So as announced, you don't normalize. It's a very rigid gas in some sense, very different from IID random variables, because without normalizing, you already converge to something that's order one. But so if you have a usual CLT, you know you do one over root n. Some of yeah, xi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. That's what I mean. You don't divide by anything. Okay, gosh. Right. So it's sum of xi alone. Yes. And so another thing that's quite interesting, and that I should say now, is that uh, so, so so far I talked about phi that's supported in the bulk. So as I said, if phi uh, overlaps the boundary, in the paper with Thomas, we have the same theorem, but you have some complications to the formulas. Okay, you have to look at some harmonic extension of phi. This is very G. You mean instead of being of order square root of n, fluctuation is order one. It's order. very close to the mean. Yes, well, uh, pr with this shift. With this shift, could you predict this shift? I don't know. It's very close to a constant. So the shift, of course, the shift is zero if the measure is a constant, because the lab, you integrate by parts. So it's a shift that corresponds to the variation of the measure. So there's something very subtle happening there. OK, so in particular, uh, if you are a probabilist here, you, you recognize there's a certain the covariance structure of this thing tells you that uh, another way of saying it is that Hn, you know, which was this potential, converges to a GFF. Because that's exactly the covariance structure that you need to have that. OK, now, the other thing you can do is you can say, Instead of having a fixed test function, phi, supported somewhere in the ball, I can have a test function that's supported on mesoscales, maybe even down to the microscale. So I can, I can take a fixed text function and I can rescale it down. That's going to give me also interesting information. All right, so phi, if phi depends itself on, on n or on a length scale. I'm going to want to take phi of x over L with L, some fixed uh, thing, which should better be bigger than the micro scale. I can do it. Yeah. I'm sorry, just a very nice question. Is it actually equivalent or not? If I do know that uh, in the risk convolution conversions to the JFF, do I know? Uh, so if you if it converges to the GFF and you take this as a test function, you write this as phi Laplacian okay, so HN. It's tautologically the same. It's, the same yeah. it's nothing uh, different. OK, so now let's imagine I want to take a phi that's localized. So it's only recently that we can do, go. I did it in a recent paper. You can really only assume that the land scale is much bigger than the micro scale. 
uh, up to now it had been, you know, powers that are strictly less than one half, but now you can really do it down to micro scale. You follow the same proof, all the same steps, but now everything has to be made quantitative in this scale L. Okay, so quantitative if estimates in L. In particular, when you look at your transport, the transport is going to uh, involve uh, more and more singular transport functions because you're transporting on a very small scale. Um, the functional inequality, you're going to use the fact that this functional inequality is actually localizable. So the V is going to be supported in a small set. So let's say a ball of radius L. And you can localize here Fn restricted to the ball. So this functional inequality has another feature that's useful, is that you can localize it. And then you use the local laws that we described yesterday. So you remember when we were doing bootstrap on scales going further and further down? You use the local laws. So every time you see expectation, uh, exponential of the energy restricted to the ball of radius L, this thing you actually bound not only by N, but by N L D. So it's, 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 it's gaining you a factor that's the small size. And so when you plug all that together, you see the proof. Everything is sharp, like everything goes down to the micro scale, but barely. And the other thing is what happens in higher dimensions. So in principle, the whole strategy you can follow in higher dimensions. But you see here how this rate has come out, this error rate. In dimension two, it didn't matter that, uh, you know, it's n, one minus something. In fact, little o of n is sufficient in dimension two. But if you look at the terms you have in dimension three, um, the rate is immediately not sufficient. So this rate one minus one over two d is not sufficient to close the argument. So that's why I still expect a CLT to hold in 3D, at least for almost all betas. But you need to be able to obtain a better free expansion, free energy expansion, with a rate here that's much better than that. And so in particular, it means you need to go beyond surface errors. You, want to, you need to find something better to get rid of the surface errors. And that I don't know how to do. But with this method and with the surface errors, it's not going to go to in higher D. In dimension two, if it's not Coulomb? So if it's not Coulomb, probably, so we're working on that. Certainly, if S is small enough, it should work, because we have plenty of uh, margin here. As I told you, like here we, we are very... So since everything is ex explicit in S and D, certainly when S is small, uh, it should go through as well. But a lot remains to be written for that uh, case. For now, this is the only theorem. So I want to, and then we should, should uh, take a break, maybe. But, um, I want to finish with one, uh, one new theorem. Actually, and then instead of JFF, you just have the Gaussian field with the potential start to please as the coherence. Yeah, so if you have a Ries interaction, your um, Instead of the variance between grad phi, being grad phi squared, you're going to get the h d minus s over yeah. 2 uh, squared. No, the same yeah. exactly. You're going to get the, the, the quadratic function that corresponds to your, to your interaction. So note that this theorem is for phi that's regular. Huh? Phi needs to be, I don't know, say c3. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I think at some point, you cannot expect a theorem like that if phi is not a bit regular. 
And a big question is what happens if you take a, the indicator of a ball? Because then it's expected that the variance is not uh, it's not one at all. It's of order. Um, it should be of order actually uh, r. It will blow up in any case. So here, sorry, what I mean by that is here now I'm in rescaled uh, in zoomed coordinates. So you, you rescale again, you're in a very large set of size n1 over d, and you make a ball of radius r. So you want to count how many points are in that ball. Um, and so there, it, there was a, a sort of conjecture for a long time which was very recently uh, resolved by Thomas Leblay, which is that the 2D Coulomb gas is what they call hyper-uniform. That is the variance of the number of points that fall in the ball. So in this zoom scale, mm -hmm is much smaller than r square. In fact, so he has how much much smaller for him is r square divided by some logarithmic factor. I forgot exactly what it is, but so it, it is explicit, but it's barely <laughs> barely little o of one. So this was uh, this was you know conjectured in physics papers. It's expected that it's even better than that, in fact. So it's another manifestation of rigidity. Uh, and he proved this, and the proof involves a lot of things, a lot of ideas. And he particularly uses all the tools I showed you. Everything is used, like the electric formulation, the, the CLT here, but more also. Um, so. I would say that in the 2D Coulomb case, we have our understanding is reasonable, much better than in all the other cases. So higher dimensional Coulomb or other interactions, much, much, uh, much more open. So I have still, a, yeah, we can take a little break and then I'll tell you some other things after the break. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say on this uh, fluctuation uh, results. I, I just wanted to add one remark, I which is that um, in the literature, um, the terms that we encounter that are I called A1, I control with the functional inequality, uh, they often are appear and they are called loop equation or dyson schwinger equations. So it's very similar terms. Uh, I think what we have is a sort of systematic way of handling them that works in any dimension, in particular in larger than two, uh, because mo most often the treatment of these terms have been dimension one, uh, dimension two. Uh, but so, just in case you know that, that you can make the connection. The, the term A1 is for the loop term or something? It's the terms that come out when you write loop equations, they have exactly the same uh, definitions, in fact. So uh, loop equation is something that corresponds in, to a translation invariance of your uh, Gibbs measure that you take advantage of with an integration by parts. And the A1 terms, they correspond to uh, the, uh, the result of doing diffeomorphisms. So, so it's, it's really so the same you idea. Say it's a Wasserstein gradient or something like that. Uh, differential with respect to transport. Differential with respect to transport, or also stress energy tensor, because that's the that's the yes, derivative the tensor, yes. along the along the, the formorphisms, inner variations, as opposed to outer variations. Okay, so there's many points of view on this, these things, but they all they all give you the same quantities that you have to control. So the fact that we can um, that we have this truncation method allows us to to give a meaning to them with this renormalization procedure. Otherwise, people are always saying, oh, we have these terms, they are too singular, we cannot work with them. Okay, except in dimension two. 
Okay, so to finish, I want to circle back a little bit to the beginning of the lectures where we talked, uh, we talked a little bit about um, crystallization, in fact, with this uh, cone kumar conjecture, dimensions 8 and 24, etc. So uh, this will allow us to give a description of the configuration at the microscopic scale. So micro scale description of the configurations. And this is actually, it works for all uh, Coulomb and EDE, but also RIS uh, in this interval D minus 2 D. Uh, and now there's like improvements of it uh, in terms of the description. So what you want to do is you have your point configuration, and again, you want to zoom. But this time, it's going to be important to uh, keep track of the zooming center. So let's call little x the point around which you zoom. And you multiply everything by n to the 1 over d. And then you get configurations of points which are now well separated, but they are going to eventually fill up the whole space. Okay, so you want to define a, a point process, Pn, which is going to be a sort of Dirac. You keep the centering point as a label here, and you take your configuration, Xn, you subtract x and you multiply everything by n to the 1 over d. Okay? And then you average in x. Maybe in some, some small ball. Okay, so this thing is, uh, for now, it's a deterministic thing. So it's, it's basically a Dirac at a certain pattern. It's the pattern that I see when I zoom, except that I also shift a little bit. Uh, and uh, the idea is that this thing is going to have a limit. So Pn is going to be tight, basically because you can control the number of points in boxes thanks to things we've seen, the local laws, for instance, the control and fluctuations. And so it will converge to some P, which will be a proba. So this is a proba, right? On, uh, if you want, okay, maybe, maybe we can call it P and X. And forget the, forget the label. Easier. Okay, so P and X R, P X R, is going to be a proba on infinite point configurations. Or on sum of Dirac's. Okay, so every time I have an infinite point configuration, I, I can identify it with the sum of delta P, P in my configuration. So this is like the sort of empirical measure. This is the point configuration. In the full space, right? Yes. So th this can be, this is an infinite sum, right? So it's infinite. So this is just a little bit of language. It's not. A okay. So um, the idea is we're going to be able to express a limit energy in terms of such. Uh, point processes. So this thing P is itself random because my configuration I throw it from a, I sample it from a random Gibbs measure and so this limit here is going to be itself random. Okay. Um, sorry, one yeah. question. Um, you need you take subsequential limit and still the limit is random, right? Or am I seeing it wrong? So. Um, you take a subsequential limit, that's true. 
And in principle, uh, yes, this limit is still random. Yeah. Okay, so each original configuration gives you an empirical measure profile. Mm -hmm. But since the original thing was random, it gives you distribution over... Yes. So that's why it's, it's a random point process, which is a law. It's a law on such things. Yeah. Okay, so what is the, the quantity that we should <laughs> measure with this? Well, we started from Fn, right? So in fact, in the Gibbs measure, the essential part of the energy is this. Uh, sorry, hold on. Uh, uh, hey, still everything on this. Uh, if you say Pxr, I have to study is the, is the random uh, uh, process itself. But uh, if you don't have uniqueness of the, of the limit, how do you define I mean, it's tight, okay, so up to extracting subsequence, yeah. you have something, but if your subsequence depends from omega to omega from, from uh, on, the, on, the, on the randomness, how do you define the process PXR? Or do you use some kind of uh, uh, measure, uh, uh, choice, measurable choice or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Selection uh, you're scaring me now. Um. Um. I'm not sure. I don't think it's a pro there's a problem there. Okay, we can, see we can maybe talk later, but I... Uh, but I think there's a compact topology on measures. Yeah. yeah. And the compactness okay. comes from the fact yes. that you have an a priori bound on the number of points. Yes, that's possible. true. Yeah. This is true, but uh, if you say PXR, the limit is the random variable. I mean, it's not a limit, it's limit up to extraction. Maybe several uh, extractions, several subsequences give different limits. Yes. No, but you extract once and for all from the B. I, I, I sort of forgot now how it works. Okay, you know? maybe there's a procedure to extract yes, once and for yes. all. It's an old paper. <laughs> I forgot. I think there is a, a procedure to extract. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have the e to the minus beta blah, which formally we can rewrite as this, right? You remember? And I ignore the renormalization. And so there is going to be a natural limit energy for infinite configurations, which is to take this sort of grad h squared but now in a box of radius r, normalized by the volume of the box, let r go to infinity, and we're gonna call that w of c for an infinite point configuration, if minus Laplacian h is c minus one. Let's see. Okay, so here I, I need to explain. <laughs> so what happens is you have this relation. Right, now you zoom everything. So when you rescale, you get minus Laplace. So there is a prime, right, so HN prime. And now here, this thing after rescaling becomes just mu v of x. So zoom near x, and there is an n here. So when you zoom near x, this density n mu v just becomes a constant. So up to scale, I could also zoom and rezoom by uh, mu v of x. 1 over d, and I would just replace this one by 1 if I want. What, what, whatever, it, it doesn't really matter. Or you can keep m here and m. Okay, so this is the sum of Dirac's minus m, which you obtain when you take now the n infinity limit. You get something of this form. So 
you have a, this elliptic PD in infinite space. The problem is that you lost the boundary condition by taking the zoom and you lost the fact that it goes to zero at infinity. So in particular, this thing is only determined up to harmonic functions. So if you want to have a good definition, you infimize over all H's. Such that this holds. So you, you, you add possible harmonic functions until you, and you take the one that has the least energy. So this defines an energy W. And then it's not too hard to show that uh, basically the energy that you started with, you can rewrite it as something, well, you can bound it from below, let's say. And I'm going to write in blown up scale and divide by n. You can bound it from below by the integral of Wm of c okay, uv of x dp x of c Okay, so regardless, and this is true for every R, in fact. So, right, so you, you give yourself some averaging scale, and you can bound this from below. It's essentially Fatou's lemma. Because you rewrite the energy in that form, and uh, you, take, uh, you take lower bounds, you take limims, because you have a bounded below quantity. You express everything in terms of these probabilities Pn. Should be a big N here. Yeah. And then you express it in terms of the limit after taking uh, after using Fatou's lemma. So it's not it's not uh, anything hard. And so this gives you So you could take R equals one, yeah. But you can take smaller R's, it's that it doesn't change anything because uh, okay. it's, uh, yeah. So at first you take R equals one. That's it. Of course, it, yeah, it should be bigger than one. I should, maybe that's why how it should say after blown up, after blown up. Okay, so if I have this bound, um, that's nice. The question is, can you have a converse bound, right? Is this, is this sharp? And in fact, it is sharp in some sense, uh, thanks to screening. So now you have this energy on infinite point configurations. And what screening allows you to do, it allows you to say, okay, if I have a minimizer for that thing, I can make it into a finite point configuration by taking a minimizer, taking some relatively large box, screening, and then copy pasting my screened configurations again. So remember how when you screen, you can have a bound for the energy from above in terms of the sum over boxes. So thanks to screening, you can sort of make a construction that gives you the converse inequality. So in particular, minimizers of the energy converge to minimizers of W. In the sense that, so you see here, you're integrating over all the centering points, but in the sense that for almost every x, you must have that uh, px almost every c minimizes w. So when you zoom, it means that most of the time, you know, 
you look at all the possible centers. Most of the time, your configuration minimizes W. Now, what is this W? It's given by this limit here. It's a bit unpleasant. But we can show that uh, W has good properties. It has a minimizer. When the configuration happens to be periodic, I can give you an explicit expression of it. So in fact, what W does for you is it gives a meaning to to the sum of g x minus y, sum of Dirac minus, say, 1 in the infinite case. Sorry, I mean double integral. Right? So if you want to sum all pair interactions, but you have an infinite configuration, how do you do that? It's not clear that you can sum the series, right? You, you cannot sum the series in principle because this, this g don't decay fast enough. Um, so instead of summing the series, what this proposes is to just view it in the integral form again and take large boxes. So a large volume limit gives a good definition. Is uh, x prime x or x y the, the arguments? x y. Okay, and in particular, if you have a configuration which is a, a repeat, a periodic repeat of a given configuration, then you can compute it in terms of the Green's function of the torus that you have here. So it's explicit in good cases. For instance. And you can show that the minimum of W is well approximated by the minimum of W over periodic, so I don't know, tau r periodic configurations when r goes to infinity. So if you don't want to compute this minimum, you can compute it over periodic configurations with larger and larger periods, and it will <coughs> converge to the minimum. And how you prove that is by screening. And so then you can replug with this uh, result that I mentioned uh, the first day, that we, a little kind of lemma that we proved with Mircea Petrake, which is that the Kohn Kumar conjecture implies that W is minimized. So this particular W that we defined is also minimized by the expected lattice. A2 in dimension 2, E8 in dimension 8, lambda 24 in uh, dimension 24. And in particular, we have a complete answer in dimensions 1, 8, 24. Okay, so W prefers lattices in these dimensions. So corollary, because they solve the conjecture in dimensions 8 and 24. E8 minimizes W in dimension 8 and lambda 24 in dimension 24. Of course, in dimension 1, it's Z. And this is for any S that I mentioned, so for all these interactions. And now we're left with A2 as a conjecture dimension 2. And it would be very nice to have that because then it would completely explain why we see these triangular lattices of vortices in superconductors. It's in dimension 2. But okay, so now we have this uh, minimum. Question, is it conjecture that W is not minimized by a lattice outside the, the exceptional dimension? Uh, so, uh, I would say after dimension 11 or something like that. Low dimensions should be lattices, probably. But after 9 or 10 or 11, for sure they will, it will start to be false. For the reasons I said the other day. Uh, okay. 
And what is the, the main obstruction for dimension two? Well, there are proof. Uh, if if this if this is the, if it's the only tool you have, there are proof. It breaks because the two-dimensional lattice doesn't have the same properties uh, as the eight and twenty-four dimensional lattice, which is the this question of the vectors of the lattice all being square root of some uh, okay. even integer. Or you f look for another proof. Yes, but good luck. <laughs> it's dimension two, I know. <laughs> it's still, uh, I would say the, 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 the approach they have is still the, the most credible approach. Uh, so, I don't know. You expect that it's true. Ah, yes. Completely. But why you expect that it's true? Huh? Because it's absurd in physics. Yes. No, 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 I explanation. Why? Uh, why I expect besides the experiments and besides the fact that I don't see a better candidate. <laughs> no. it, it, I, I, it's true that yes, I. I you know, Sylvia lives with this problem. If she if she expects it, we have to hear her. <laughs> no, but uh, from the point of mathematical point. Of no, from a mathematical point of view, I, I think that um, the most credible argument is the fact that their proof works in dimensions 8 and 24. So there is a beginning of a proof there. There is a beginning of a proof, there's just one piece that's missing. Right. Uh, uh, is it the missing part? Is a kind of renormalization procedure? No. So what is the missing part? It's really about finding these, uh, these special functions that have these very fine properties about their behavior on the lattice and the behavior of their Fourier transform. Okay. So they build it with this modular function. Okay. Okay. And uh, it's not something I have a lot of intuition for. No. No, but, but it's proved that among all parallel configurations, the... Ah, uh, yes. So that's an old result from the 50s. It's the best lattice. Best lattice. Ah. So that's a hint. If you believe in a lattice, it's the best. Ah, okay. But there could be some, like, weird, I don't know. Is it a local uh, <laughs> kind of minimizer? Ah, yeah, it's a local minimizer. It's stable. It has good properties. If there is another candidate, it's yes. If there is another candidate, it's... Uh, it would be, um, okay. yeah, I, I don't believe it, but I don't have a proof. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, maybe I would have gotten the Fields Medal. <laughs> um, okay, so, yes, what I wanted to say is now that sort of settles uh, the question of minimizers of the energy, if you're interested in minimizers, right? And it, it means that when you zoom, they are very regular, at least in low dimensions. You expect that there are triangular lattices in dimension two. There are lattices in these particular dimensions. Et and what we uh, also did is uh, we looked at it with temperature. So with temperature. We have a theorem with Thomas Leblay, which said that there is an LDP at speed n for, uh, you know, the push forward of Pn beta by this map the map that from xn gives you uh, p x r n. Right, so every time you have an xn, you get uh, a collection of these p x n r. And with rate okay, so the speed should depend on r really. And so it's speed R D with rate function beta W
plus some relative entropy, which happens to be called a specific relative entropy of the point process Px with respect to the Poisson point process. Okay, so when you have an LDP, it means that, uh, so this is, let's call this F beta with rate function F beta minus minimum of F beta, that's, that's the correct rate function. So it means that everything will concentrate on minimizers of that. So maybe Cedric, that answers your question, I'm not sure, but you see, what you do is you take the push forward of, you have this deterministic map, you take the push forward by P and beta. And that's the thing that's yeah. on which you extract yeah. something. Yes, yes. yes you have a set, uh, But okay, so you see you have the structure of beta times an energy plus a relative entropy, so what is that? It's the limit as r goes to infinity of the usual entropy. Yes, absolutely. Then you have, you have, it has to convert to the minimizers. Of this uh, restricted um, to a cube of size r, Poisson restricted to a cube of size r. There's just one thing if the set of, depends on what the set of minimizers is, maybe. Um, well, no, the set of minimizers, you don't need to know. Yeah, that, I mean, this thing tells you that it's very unlikely that you get out yeah. of the set of minimizers, yes. that's for sure. And unfortunately, we don't know that minimizers is unique, mm -hmm. except in dimension one. So, so how do you get the limit? I mean, you have a limit for r, la, r large of n. No, you fix r here, but r could depend on n. Uh, I should have, uh, yeah, so R is a scale. It's the scale at which you average. I tried to put several theorems into one and maybe it was a bad idea, but uh, you average over a scale R. So in principle, if you want R, you can do epsilon n1 minus n1 over d, but you can also go down to scale. Um, um, so R is in blown up scale, right? So you can go all the, almost all the way down to one. So with Thomas Leblay, we did it at the macro scale. So the averaging was microscopic always. And, and with Scott, uh, we did it uh, down to the micro scale. So you don't need to average so much. But it's the same rate function. So in the rate function, you see the competition between energy and entropy. So if you have, uh, for example, the fact, I mean, this conjecture which says that W yeah. is a minimizer, when, that, when beta goes to infinity, it settles the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, it says something. It says that when beta goes to infinity, you can neglect the entropy part. You converge to minimizers of W. Uh, so in dimension two, you should see triangular lattices when temperature goes to zero, which actually they see in the numerical experiment. Another reason is numerics, I'm sure, but, <laughs> but that's still not a proof. I agree, I agree, I agree. So, uh, right, so, so it's a form of crystallization, but it's a crystallization at really at zero temperature. But otherwise, with the entropy, you, you probably expect that, uh, I mean, the, the minimizer are different. In, I mean. Ah, yeah, so, so uh, the minimizer of this for fixed beta, so, so by the way, uh, Cedric, this is meant to answer one of your questions of the beginning, why I scale things with beta n minus s over d times the energy, because that's the scaling that gives you an interesting LDP. Otherwise, if you scale differently, you just keep one of the two terms. Yes, but okay, yes you have the two terms at the same time. You have the two terms at the same, at the same speed, but so, uh, when beta is fixed, in principle, you have point processes that are uh, these sort of Coulomb beta point processes, and they are not lattices. You know, they are not crystalline. They are they have a bit of uh, they are shaken. So you know, you look, the only one we know is the Ginibre point process, which corresponds to beta equals two in dimension two, and we know how 
you know, how to compute many things about it, its correlation functions, etc. And it's certainly not periodic or not crystalline. So the, the sort of uh, noise in the point process appears as soon as beta is not, uh, not infinite from that point of view. But it doesn't rule out the possibility that at the level of correlations, you see a transition. You see? What the physicist will tell you is crystallization. It's a transition in the decay of the correlation functions. And that says nothing about that. This is more like uh, looking at the patterns and what they look like. It doesn't tell me if correlations. This is more at the energetic level, but not the level of correlation. Uh, so, so you see, of course, now when beta is very large, you minimize W. When beta is very small, you converge to a Poisson point process, mm -hmm. be, which is normal because when beta is very small, you just tune out the interaction and you throw your points at random. Yeah. So. Um, I appreciate you cannot say so much on the quantitative level about crystallization, but can you say, for example, even if beta is very large, uh, the configuration is extremely? Like there's no information in the tail signal algebra. In the what? In the tail signal algebra. What is that? But like if, if beta is infinite, you see this lattice, uh, A2, right? Or that's expected? So A2, it's only expected, but it's not a proof, but yes. Okay, let's. But then, okay. So let's accept maybe that it happens. But yeah. Okay, okay. So I mean, in that case, you can still see one uh, variable, which is sort of the position of the lattice, but also the. the ah, the the thing. Pairs. So the, uh, this is nothing about that. You could, you could, um, if a two is minimal, you could take a two and you could tilt it and then copy paste with rotated versions of it, and at ah. the level of the energy, you don't see much of a difference. This would be an even lower order effect if you want. So, so this is too crude to because it's average and because it's uh, taking average over large boxes in any case. You could, you could make many configurations that have the same energy as A2 that are built from rotating triangular lattices and re-gluing them and you would have like uh, dislocations okay. in some sense. And this would have the same energy. So. In, in some sense, what, what this says is these guys are minimizers, but they're not unique minimizers. They are the best ones, but in the sense of computing the energy, you don't see the difference. But there's no kind of global magnetization where you really see globally. No, this would be a much better uh, result in some sense, right? This is why I was saying it says nothing about correlations. It says nothing about something where globally you see the order. We are far from something like that that would be better. Definitely stronger. And so uh, to, to finish, the one, one thing is that now we can identify the function f beta that we discussed uh, as the, is the limit, you know, the thermodynamic limit. So what f beta is, is really the mean of that over uh, stationary point processes. You have a sort of variational characterization of this constant. And so also to, before I finish, yeah. Uh, no, not necessarily. Huh? Not necessarily. So they have to, the intensity is fixed, of course, huh? or fixed intensity. So it's been normalized every time. It's at mu v of x or something. But you can normalize here to be 1 if you want. I want to acknowledge uh, some of my collaborators that I have not mentioned. So there is Etienne Sandier, who was at the beginning of this uh, electric formulation, etc. Nicolas Rougerie, I didn't mention him. Mircea Petraque. Simona Rotanodari. And you've heard of the other ones, Thomas Leblay and Scott Armstrong. Okay. So hopefully uh, there will be a set of notes that corresponds to what I discussed and more. Uh, and if you want, I can already give you 
preliminary version. There's 100 pages are kind of clean, and then uh, 80 pages are a mess, so you will recognize which part is clean. What is the convergence uh, speed? Uh, of the reading? Of yeah. the writing? <laughs> it's a touchy question, right? <laughs> Every time I think it's going to be finished this year. Huh? Ah, the convergence for complete uh, cleanliness? No, uh, more than a month. Ah, okay. More than a month. Okay, maybe we can have the preliminary version we put in on the web, or you don't want to, to be put in the maybe web? Maybe on the web, I don't know. <laughs> but if you email me directly, I'm happy to send it. No, but let's wait for the final version. The final version, yes. As I said, every year, I think it's this year. So probably it's this year. It's like an induction <laughs> argument. This is a <laughs> no, no, but it, there is progress because I was teaching this course um, also at ENS, a longer course. I really worked on cleaning up. Uh, so there's been progress this year. I, I, I really hope that at the end of 2023 it's done. The 80 pages are inside the thing, so there's the extra part. Now there's a, a hundred clean play pages followed by uh, 70 not clean pages. But where you will recognize what I discussed, it's still, uh, okay, so, okay. right? I just would not want to put them on the internet uh, okay. in this state. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Are there other questions from you or comments? Actually, there were also already a lot of questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, to recall, so in this super neat uh, theorem, what are the assumptions which uh, range? Ah, uh, so this is, uh, sorry, I, I, I tried to say before, it's quite general, this one, because it's, uh, at least the macroscopic uh, result, it's all these risks d minus 2 to d. And uh, log the down to r equals 1, that's cool. For now, but uh, I expect it will uh, work for, for risk as well. But every time you do risk, you have to work more. It's not. Uh, but so, yeah, this is the regime. We even have a, 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 a theorem. Uh, it's a different theorem but, uh, with a different rate function, but we also did risk s bigger than d. The, the super, the hyper singular case it's called, and that was with Hardin and Saf and Lublin. So that's a funny uh, regime because in this regime, the if you want, there is no uh, uh, there is no um, equilibrium measure. And so the density and the microscopic behavior play at the same at the same level. You you derive them at the same uh, order, uh, and um, yes. And so so the the optimal density is given kind of implicitly from the microscopic uh, problem as well. So this is actually uh, also an interesting. Interesting region. Il y a un truc, maybe. Le R là, il était limité à 1 sur à n puissance 1 sur 10, hein? Ah ouais, ouais, il faut qu'il soit beaucoup plus grand que n puissance 1 sur d, ouais. Mais alors, en, en, en disons en échelle zoomée, c'est beaucoup plus grand que 1, quoi. En moyenne, so it's it's an open question to prove something like this without averaging first the centering. It would be better, right? You just take a point, zoom, get an LDP, but that we don't know how to do. So first we take a point, then we average in a more more than microscopic ball, and then we get an LDP. In the original theorem with Thomas, we had to average at the macroscopic level.
Well, thank you for your attention and patience. Thank you. Thank you.